This is Coda Radio, episode 436 for October 18th, 2021. Hey, good look and welcome into Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show, taking a pragmatic look at the art and the business of software development and the world of technology. This here episode is brought to you by a cloud guru. You know they have that cloud playground, Azure, AWS, and Google Cloud sandboxes on ACG's credit card, not yours. Get certified, get hired, get learning at a cloudguru.com. My name is Chris, and joining us with credit card in hand, ready to pounce, it is our host, Mr. Dominic. Hello, Mike. Hello, Mr. Fisher. Hello, sir. Full disclosure, you and I are recording this on a Monday, just after Apple's new Mac event. So we'll talk about it a little bit today. It's called Mac Day, right? Yeah. But by the time people are listening to this, it's, they're probably feel, feeling like it's been Mac week and they're kind of done with it. <laughs> so we understand that. We do grok that. Uh, but we got to find out, is uh, Mike getting a new Mac? So what do you think? Uh, holy That's shit. If I'm getting a new Mac, you think holy shit. Okay. I think you have to like I and I'm not even exaggerating when I say this. I truly think this is probably the most significant Mac upgrade I've ever seen in 30 years. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I'm not really. I can tell you why. Okay. The current problem I have with my Apple computers is a deep feeling of betrayal and disappointment in my iMac Pro. Oh, because for my workloads, which have nothing to do with video editing, right, it is consistently either matched or lapped by my MacBook Air M1. Okay, you're losing me. <laughs> well, so, so just hear me out, right? The, the gaining factor is not how quickly I can, like, bootstrap a Python workload anymore. Sure, sure. Okay. It's just fast enough. So was the uh, iMac, to be fair. I track what you're saying. You're saying really all this additional performance and cores and RAM doesn't really change your day-to-day -day job. This is unusually reasonable and logical. I don't really know how to process this. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, right now, the gating factor to my development pr progress, right, like making forward progress, is like getting developable specs and specking out features. And I could see that. Um, my my gate factor was the RAM, uh, because if I was going to make a transition to something where the uh, Mac OS would be the primary OS. I'd need a lot of overhead for virtualization and 16 gigs of RAM sort of was a killer for me, but also just the display limitations of the M1 were also a bit of a, a killer for me. There's ways around it with like Thunderbolt uh, display port adapters and whatnot, but I thought that was a, you know, I'm not a big fan of having to do that. I should just, the, the hardware should be able to just support multiple screens. You don't want to dongle up your way to glory? <laughs> uh, and you know, the rumors got it right. 16 inch and 14 inch, just as expected. Uh, increased resolutions and pixel density as expected. Touch bar is gone. And I, I said before the event started to um, Alex, my co-host on Self-Hosted, I said, if Apple adds the ports back, that's a pretty big reversal. And if they get rid of the touch bar, that's pretty much Apple addressing the criticism from most of the diehard Mac users. And they did both those things. Plus they added 120 hertz pro motion to the display. And they've added MagSafe back. And it's faster now. You get 50% charge in 30 minutes. And you can get up to like 32 gigs of RAM. No, I'm sorry, 64 gigs of RAM on the... On the, on the top one. Yeah, yeah. For me, the numbers that really impress me these days, and they nail, nailed the timing on this, is the performance to power ratio. Because in the back of my mind, I'm always kind of thinking, well, what if I want to go work out of the woods for a week and I'm running off solar and it's the winter and there's very little solar. Having something that just, even if the numbers were like 10 to 20% less than what they claimed on stage, which I don't think they will be, at 30 watts is truly a revolutionary breakthrough in the PC industry. In some workloads, the M1 Max chip is using 100 watts less than an AMD or, or Intel part of similar speed. 100 watts for me, it, and that's a continuous thing, right? So that... That means a, a continuous draw, and they're maxing out in the high 30 range. They, haven't, they didn't say specifically what it was, but on their chart, it was 30 watts. That means my whole family has more power for longer. Like, I can stretch solar. Like, that's, that's a big deal, and they're really nailing that right now in a way that nobody else in the industry is. You make a good point. Maybe I'm being a little too cold, cold watery on this. But if you've, like, been rocking a 2015, 20, whatever, even like a 20... 
19 might be pushing it, but any of the Intel Macs and you don't have like the need to virtualize Windows on Intel, which is a thing I still do on my iMac Pro for all the shit I give it because I have to do it for client projects. It's kind of a no brainer, which scares me for like the Linux vendors. Yeah, yeah. Because the prices are steep. I mean, the model I would buy, I did get into the configurator and it's like $3,800 and it's almost $3,900. Yeah, and then it's over four grand after shipping. Right, and, and then you get taxed into it, yeah. Yeah, the shipping, I think, was free, but the taxes, the, for my spec'd out one that I was just checking out before the show, before the configurator page went down, uh, was $4,300 after uh, tax. Yeah, it's a lot, but it's definitely a multi-year computer. You know, for us, Mac so rarely comes through the studio that every Mac JB's ever bought <laughs> is still around in some capacity. They just get... De- relegated to lesser and lesser important tasks. Like none of them are really involved at all in production anymore, but they do other things, ancillary things like, you know, maybe run a soundboard or, uh, you know, I, I, my kid can play Minecraft on it. And they, they are, some of them are, you know, 10 years old. Like they really last, especially when you just want to play a Java app or something. It's, it's pretty impressive. So I'm not so worried about long term the, uh, the price, but up front, it's just high enough that I have to go, all right, well, let's be sensible about this. First thing I have to do is I have to replace the JB core server here. But then once I get that up and going, like, and I actually, I'm extremely, extremely thankful. We had a, a listener, the real zombie, send us an amazing Dell. It's a, it's used to him, right? But it's it's brand new to me. And it's loaded to the gills with like 384 gigs of RAM on, on like 24 cores of CPU, like it's just incredible. I mean, it's going to be a powerhouse system, but I still have to get like f- nearly 30, 40 terabytes worth of storage for it. So I want to get all that stuff figured out. And then I think I'm going to look at this real hard. You know how I like to operate. Like if I'm going to get something, I'm generally going to get it before the tax when the tax season is over. So that way it goes on to these, this year's taxes. And so it'll be in, it, I think it's going to happen. I just, I feel like I need to do a little more research on virtualization what it's like to run Linux on this. And then the other story that's going to be really interesting is if the Asahi Linux guys get Linux running on the M1 Max and Pro. That is going to, we don't know yet. That could be a whole different ballgame or everything could just work and it could just work faster. We just don't know yet. And when we start to get signs of that, even just early signs, that'll probably also, well, or I'll buy it before then. It's coming soon, I think. It's, this is the one I've been waiting for. See, I feel like if you really want it, this is the one you're waiting for. And you, you probably want to cover it too, right? Even in the other shows that are more Linux focused. I wouldn't wait too long because those ship times are going to get rough. Yeah. Yeah. With the part shortage, I think you might be right. I've been thinking about that. Yeah. And I think too, like, I think a lot of people in the Linux community for the, you know, thinking of the other shows, um, I think they kind of have blinders on this one. They'll, they'll, they'll have, they'll joke about the notch. Or uh, they'll they'll mock the price, and they're failing to see like what is truly a value here is to certain types of professionals. This has an incredible uh, ap- set of appealing features from from battery life and performance, but also the speaker system on the MacBook Pro 16 is better than any other PC out there. And I've even had vendors send me their laptops where they've boasted about this impressive Dolby system with a subwoofer built in that they've. They've worked with this so-and-so musician to make this amazing sound system in the laptop. And it's a joke compared to the MacBook Pro 16. They also have a multi-mic array setup in the laptop that actually gives you a usable microphone for video conferences. And you don't sound like That's the one thing that is that does ever so slightly tempt me because I spend my life in the nightmare that is Zoom meetings. And when you bring it all together... The, the new keyboard is good. The, these new screens with ProMotion. Is it new? The, you know, since, the, since 2019. It's not the magic. It's not the, or it's not the butterfly anymore. It's the magic keyboard. They fixed the damn keyboard, right? You take the good, solid industrial design, the super high-resolution screen, the very good audio system, the improved camera, and the M1 Max and Pro performance with the battery life, and you add that all together, I don't really think there is an x86-based laptop that actually competes on all of those points. Now, like yourself, not everyone needs that stuff. 
So it's not like I'm not sitting here saying it's a laptop for everyone, but I just think they nailed it. I think I was expecting what we got with the M1 Pro. And when we saw 32 core on the M1 Max, that's when they broke my brain. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm kind of surprised that the SD card made a return. Oh, yeah. And the ports. I forgot about the ports. Right. That's a big deal, too. MagSafe. I'm actually it's not clear to me if that's like, can you charge via USB-C as well? Because I have just a ton of USB-C stuff now. I know. I sure hope so. But what happens if both of them are providing power? Does it default to the MagSafe? I hope, but who knows? I assume it does. But my my fear is that you can't charge via USB-C. So that, like, for all your peripherals, you got to carry USB-C cables and you have to carry this MagSafe uh, cable. Yeah, that would suck. Yeah, but no, it's good stuff. Yeah. We don't really know how the GPU stacks up to the mid-tier and high-tier NVIDIA or AMD GPUs yet. We can look at the numbers and get an idea that's competitive. But we don't really know. And, you know, there's a lot of workloads out there that are just simply designed for DirectX or Vulkan. And so these machines will never be applicable. But it does look really good. They they didn't screw it up. Right? And that's what we can say. They didn't screw it up. They they made very compelling laptops again. And it's been a while since I've, I've had that. I've had that feeling about Apple. It's been years, really. Yeah, it's good stuff. All right, a long timer is stuck at a fork in the road, Mike, and uh, he writes in. You remember uh, KP Vok or K K Pock or yeah, you remember him. Mm-hmm. He's been a listener since 2014. He says Coder is one of his can't miss podcasts, and he's got two questions for us. He says I work as a senior software engineer for a large corporation. It's a major Department of Defense contractor. Recently, due to the White House mandate, oh, I know where this is going. My employer has implemented a policy stating all employees must receive their final vaccination by November 24th. Now, without getting into the whole hot button issue of the COVID vaccine, its effectiveness and mandates, I've yet to decide if I want to follow through with the shot or if I want to find employment elsewhere. Do you all know of any resources for finding software engineering jobs at employers who are not mandating that all workers be vaccinated? Huh. Uh, He goes on to say, my second question is, do you have any advice for getting through the HR tech buzzword filters? An example of this is on my end. I got turned down over the past year by GitLab for just not having, quote, significant professional experience with Ruby on Rails. And over the last five years, I've worked on many different framework backends, including Java Tomcat, Node.js Express, Python Flask, ASP.NET, C Sharp, Go. He's even played around with Django, which we'll get into in a bit. He says that I feel like I have a lot of qualifications, but I don't have specific buzzword qualifications, even though I could learn those skills very quickly. Any advice would be appreciated. And y'all never again find an exit strategy from the show. Well, so to his first question about trying to, you know, leave over the mandate or whatever, that's everybody's, that's your decision. Um, I would, uh, I would say you're probably at the right time and place to do it just because the job market's so hot right now that it is a job seekers market at the moment in terms of hiring. Now, in terms of getting around buzzword filters, what are your thoughts on that? Do you do you come up with a way or do you just find a way to incorporate the buzzwords into your No, you just lean you, you just embrace the demon blood that is the buzzwords. I mean, it sucks, right? But <laughs> what are you going to do? Right. But if if the company's big enough to have HR, I mean, everybody who kind of knows what they're doing will know that your resumes have BS anyway. I mean, you could you could try sending them a PowerPoint. Before I interview with you, I'd like to present a case as to why buzzwords are a bad way to review candidates. And no, it's not going to work. <laughs> you, you just got to get past the HR folks. I mean, it's it's annoying. It's, I, yeah, you just do right. They're they're there for a reason, and that reason is to. I actually don't understand why HR gets in front of hiring. Oh, you know why. Oh, I know what they're really for. Oh, I know what they're really for. Yeah. <laughs> <But> yeah. <laughs> it's totally 100% about c- cover your bottom for the company, right? Like there's so many laws and rules and it varies state by state too about hiring. And I know this because, and you you must have witnessed this as well. It was so loosey goosey when I first started doing IT, like, and I was a kid back then and they just have me come in and sit in on any old interview and ask any old question. And then, you know, we'd sit around afterwards and talk about the candidate and there was no, no like rep from HR that stopped by and said, um, Mr. Fisher, before you go into that interview, uh, be sure you don't ask these questions, like none of that. And then as time went on, 
oh man, I, you you became a partner with HR. You no longer went out and did the interviewing and the hiring yourself. You worked in a partnership with HR to find the candidate, and they are the front line to uh, help keep you from being inundated with applications, which is the reason they tell you, which is in part true. <laughs> That's part of it. But it's also about covering the uh, bottom of the company. My first uh, interview was with somebody who ran a, a tech company, but was from a very different, more um, loose industry. And her first question to me was like, hey, Mike, so you got a girlfriend? Oh, do, maybe you don't like girls. Well, like right into like, how old are you? <laughs> Like, oh, yeah. you know, which train did you take? Oh, yeah, that part area sucks. I'm like, whoa. This, and I didn't know. But, I mean, in a weird way, it was a, it was very disarming because I was like, oh, okay. I'm like, you know, I was super young. I was like 19. I was interviewing for some contracting thing. But it disarmed me. But now I was like, I would never ask those questions ever. Like, And I mean, I know KP knows this because he's listened to the show since 2014. But there there is a game you can play here. You can look at it as a game or a genuine opportunity. But... Social engineering, that's what it is. I mean, yeah, you 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 engineer it. And like we said last week, you could even engineer the resume a little bit for the for the specific uh, place you're applying. But also, and this is another thing we say on the show all the time, participate in an open source project that is using these languages and get involved and get on their GitHub and get out there a little bit. And you can point to that as experience. So you can say, I have all this on job experience with everything from Java to Go, but I also have community free time experience, which demonstrates that you have a passion for this stuff. Uh, and I've worked with Ruby uh, with XYZ open source project. Here's a link to their GitHub. Man, that works. We hear from people all the time that works. And it's something that we didn't mention last week, but it's something we try to mention from time to time. All right. Nate is plagued by his, his just his general dev environment setup. He says, hi, Mike and Chris. I'm a longtime listener and PHP web developer turned into a Salesforce developer. I recently started a side project for mostly education purposes on using Python with fast API per Mike's suggestion and Angular that integrates within Salesforce. This project, like others, I've started to learn a new framework or language or an API, but it's been plagued by a seemingly tedious process of setting up my development environment. There seems to be 50 different popular tutorials for setting up an Angular environment or a Python development environment for various purposes. Added on to that, there's often the magic scripts that just do a plethora of things that really I don't even think are often needed. And oftentimes, I find I get into actually building and get working on something and then encounter an issue with my environment that blocks me from proceeding until I determine how to correct it or I just start over with a whole new environment. Consequently, well, very little progress is made on actually building what I want to build. So how do you go about setting up your environment for something that might be newer to you? Are there go-to resources that you trust? Is it something wrong with my process? I understand that setting up an environment is part of the learning, but it seems just disproportional to my end goals. I would love any help I can get so that way I can actually learn new skills and build my projects. Nate. So he's getting stuck on the environment setup. And I, I wonder if, if this is something maybe you used to run into that maybe you've normalized now. Uh, that would be a nice stream. So <laughs> <laughs> no, this is, I mean, I, I know this feels like a terrible answer, man, but it's always bad. Anytime you have to have a new tool chain. Hell, for me, anytime Mac OS updates, I have like a 50% chance of it just breaking all my homebrew packages and having to go through that arduous process of reinstalling everything. I mean, you asked about Python specifically. I think the fast API tutorials, but more importantly, the example apps on GitHub are good. You know, like anything else, it's it's always going to be annoying to set up toolchain, right? There's always going to be some dumb thing that didn't link right together. For Python specifically, VS Code and PyLance do make it somewhat less painful, but you're still going to have to set up Postgres or whatever database. And that's still going to be a manual process. I, yeah, I mean, not to tie two emails together, but for anybody doing Rails, like the last uh, writer, uh, Go Rails actually has a great, like, step by step getting set up with Ruby and Rails on all the platforms, including WSL. But that's super rare. Like, that's, I guess maybe I could attempt to write one for like getting set up with Fast API. But the problem is, some package is going to update somewhere on some distro or Mac OS. And it's going to be out of date. So I, it's it's always bad. Like for instance, Mac OS Monterey is coming out on the twenty fifth. Guess who's not upgrading? Right, because you know it's gonna it's gonna be a bad time, and it's gonna break my setup. Right, yeah. 
You know, I will mention, uh, just as a reminder, our friends over at Cloud Guru do have a certified entry-level Python programming course that is a good starting place. It also helps you prep for a certification if you want it, and it covers the environment you'll be working in. It also covers some, it covers some Python fundamentals, like the data types, control flow structures, functions and generators, all that kind of stuff. But you'll feel pretty comfortable with it by the time you finish that course. So go look for the certified entry-level Python programmer course, or I'll have a link in the show notes for that. And that's from a cloud guru at a cloudguru.com. But additionally, on top of that, I feel like this project is being solved uh, at a software level um, by several different places at the moment. Uh, like our friends over at Fedora are trying to solve this essentially with Silver Blue, where you will have an immutable system that you can update and you can roll back if something doesn't work right and the applications and their data are completely separate from the operating system. And they use an environment called Toolbox. And Toolbox creates pet containers where you actually install everything inside these pet containers that are isolated from the core operating system. You just launch a terminal, you know, a terminal emulator just looks like a regular old Linux terminal with bash but it's actually inside a container environment that can access your file system as if it was a regular terminal. And anything you install and create in there is in that contained environment and doesn't go on the host operating system. So you can upgrade, say, your version of Fedora or whatever it is, and that environment remains consistent and persistent. Containers are another way this is being solved, and I think one of the reasons you're seeing container use explode is because it gives developers a predictable environment. And that's what's been the secret success of containers is that is such a needed thing for creating your applications or delivering your applications. So what you're stumbling onto, Nate, is kind of a core problem that the industry has been throwing a lot of engineering resources at solving recently. So you're not alone on this one, my friend. But perhaps you could be using a more modern workflow. And if you're just starting out, why not look into running your Python development environment out of a container? It's not that crazy. People do it already. And uh, then you can move it, you can upgrade your OS, and as long as your container still starts, you're going to be good to go. It's not like the perfect solution, and it would be really, really nice if desktop operating systems were better at this kind of thing. Um, but the very flexibility that lets you install a development environment and access those libraries and components from all the different applications is the very thing that makes this so tricky. So Josh writes in, and he has our last email for the week, and... He knows that you and I are not big on virtual events, but he wonders what we thought about virtual developer events, specifically developer conferences like uh, the upcoming .NET 2021 conference on November 9th. The Google I.O. has been a thing that's going to be virtual for a while. He's curious what we think, and do we actually end up trying out any of the new stuff, like the new APIs that get announced at these virtual events? He says, thanks for our time. Curious to know our thoughts. Josh. So specifically. Virtual events for developers. What are your thoughts on that? I do not like them. Um, I feel like they lose a lot. I feel like in a way they're kind of inauthentic. I mean, the presenters do a great job. I'm not trying to be whatever. But part of it is like seeing something cool in a presentation and then like having a, a chat with the presenter after or even just huddling with maybe the people you know, right? The folks you know at the convention and being like, eh, is that how I would do it? I don't know. Or, you know, if you're an iOS developer back in the day when I did that full time, like, wow, they have to do that on Android? <laughs> that sounds terrible. Yikes. Too much. I mean, I, it's the same way I feel about the general tech uh, conferences that we've talked about at length for the last month or two. I, I think you lose something over Zoom or Google or whatever, you know, voice chat you're using. So, 100%. And enthusiasm is one of them, you know, getting getting excited about stuff. Unless you have a Hollywood production budget for your virtual event. Uh, I like that uh, Sage Alicious in the chat room says that, you know, I worked Python professionally on Macs and almost every developer team had their own environment set up slightly differently. He says some systems were using Python for Mac OS, installing it from Homebrew. Others were installing it from Pi environment. Others were installing it via Anaconda. Like it's just all over the place. It's gross, really. You know, Josh, back to the virtual events. I go into in our Coderly, which is going to be out this week, our Coderly report. I go into why I think virtual conferences have a massive reckoning coming, which I got a little insider info on that. Uh, but that aside, which I'll leave that for the Coderly, there can be a positive. So I'll, I'll focus on the positive of virtual events. The positive is 
they do become available to people who could never make it. You know, people who couldn't travel or it was too far or whatever. They just couldn't make it. And now they can attend. So there's that. Additionally, because it's new, like it's still kind of still kind of possible to, to sometimes at the right virtual event actually have a conversation with the presenter like in a side chat room because there's not hundreds or thousands of people hitting them at once all the time or her can happen though and so sometimes that can be a positive people are a little more accessible because the event itself is just a little less um there's less going on right like after they're done with their zoom presentation they turn off their camera the next person goes and they're just sitting there at their computer answering chats and so sometimes you can reach people that you couldn't reach in person because they'd have a whole crowd around them but to be honest i'm reaching for that one (laughs) that is me trying to find (laughs) something (laughs) <laughs> that I feel like is a positive outside of just the accessibility. What I would really like to see happen is a pretty significant reduction in virtual events, which I think is going to happen. I think it's, um, it's already, it's already, the reckoning's already begun. And I'd like to see in-person events try harder at streaming and doing virtual aspects and making the presentations available online quickly posting the videos and that's really all that needs to be done if they could just get the videos turned around quicker and it's possible you know you could this this show is live streamed right now and with a push of a button on several different streaming platforms i could make that live stream available now we prefer to edit and refine the show but for a presentation at an event totally usable so there's There is just a workflow issue there, I think, Josh, and I hope that people figure that stuff out, and I hope the in-person events uh, tick back up again. What do you say we move on to some Hoopla? You feel like... uh, I don't believe you. Feel like talking about some Hoopla? Hang on. My Singleton service just destroyed all my databases for my AAA game that made billions of dollars. (laughs) Oh, man. Yeah. So I love Diablo. Always raising the Dark Lord. Stay wild and listen. That's right. And I, I've i Diablo 1, Diablo 2, all the Diablos. Is there a Diablo 3? I don't know. Yeah, well, what, 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 yo, there, yeah there is, I was going to say, what about the bad one? Diablo 3? Yeah, I don't remember that one. <laughs> That's right. I, I love Mac OS, except for that whole three-year period of keyboards that didn't work. Yes. Right, sure, sure. So this is funny, right? Uh, multiple outages, data loss, as you said. Uh, caused by, um, again, essentially an internal wound. Uh, <laughs> yeah. oh, technical debts of mother. It's funny because the only other MM- MMO that I'm familiar with on the internal structure, what eventually got them was the same kind of like login, spin up a new instance process was just bogged down with technical debt, which sounds like exactly what happened to the Diablo 2 servers. And then, of course, they had to do all kinds of really user hostile things like they had to throw up a rate limit and queue up users. So that way people go to launch their video game and they'd have to be told to wait. And uh, back in my day, like when Diablo one came out, you just installed it on your damn computer and played it. But now it was shareware too. There was a shareware version. Yeah. Yeah. Like you could do like the first, first dungeon level. you could get to, dungeon, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's what it was. Yeah. First dungeon. <laughs> yeah. That was fun too, because those local games, you know, when you got bored with them, you could start modding them. And uh, same with Minecraft. Like this is, my son still prefers to play the Java edition of Minecraft because after you've played it for a lifetime, you get bored and you want to start experimenting with it and you want to add and change things in the game. And these these remote games, you know, the anti-cheat stuff prevents that. And sometimes they prevent you from playing. The one true version of Minecraft is the Java version. <laughs> so yeah, Diablo 2. Um, All the money in the world, right? And they still go down. Well, but... First of all, I love the, and there's a link to this in the show notes, the uh, technical rep who wrote this. Because he says, to maintain the integrity of the the original Diablo 2 experience, we kept the legacy code. (laughs) Translation, stop yelling at us. It's those bastards from the 90s that did this. Like, it's a tried and true in the consulting world. You blame the other developers every time. You just say, oh, they, those guys, they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. But my favorite thing, I mean, they, so they're, let's not get too much in the weeds here, but they have, you know, Diablo 2, it's not, you know, some indie game that like you're, it's not Celeste, which Celeste is awesome. You should play Celeste. But you have to log in because, you know, 
<laughs> got to get that sweet, sweet licensing money. You have regions, right? North America, Asia, Europe, and I think there might be a Pacific region, like the islands. I don't. In World of Warcraft, which apparently this is not running on the same infrastructure because World of Warcraft does not have this problem. Fine, you would think you're logging into your re- region, but it turns out there's like a master like login and game creation service that is a singleton, which means there can only ever be one in the known universe hmm. that just got hammered because it was written in the 90s and not ready for one. Diablo 2 is probably more popular now than it was then, right? Because nostalgia plus new people. Um, also, people's gameplay habits have changed, right? I also had Diablo 2. It was on CD-ROMs. I played it offline. Yeah, okay. Right, so... Yes, children, the the computers used to have this tray in the beige box that they came in where you would hit a button, it would open, and you put a round Frisbee in it. Or, or a cup, depending on... You could have a... Yeah, yeah. well, I hope not. <laughs> but I mean, it's the game, Diablo 2, is, uh, its initial release date was in two thousand, the year 2000. So it's, you know... Yeah, it was developed in the 90s, though, right? It was... Ha- yeah, absolutely it was, yeah. I mean, there's a series of books, Stay a While and Listen, and I apologize, I forget the author's name. I highly recommend them. There's two of them. And they talk about the development of Diablo 1 and Diablo 2. And if you read those books, you will know the old adage, never get into networking. Mm-hmm. Because making that stuff work on early aughts slash 1990s modems, not, not fun. So the whole thing crashed. And because of the way they architected the system... They not only had to implement these, uh, let's just say, obnoxious like logging queues and uh, rate limiting. They actually lost like a day and a half of data. Yeah, that's a shame. <laughs> because the database kept trying to back itself up, which meant it couldn't resolve write transactions. And I know we're getting deep into like why databases are scary, but this is just like a classic. Like this is a multi-billion-dollar company. This is. Amazing. Yep. And I'll do another book recommendation. Uh, Exercising Legacy Code, I believe is the title. This is a, like the best case. I encourage you all to read it. This is the best case study for why working with legacy code that was written, maybe not, and I'm not saying the code is bad, right? But it was written with different expectations about what the environment would be like. And different use scale. Different use scale. Definitely different scale, right? Different, just like the whole concept of networking was different. It's one of the worst and most complicated problems. Like, like so someone in the email has mentioned that I had done some military contracting. This is the challenge in that field because everything is basically old. Sure. Right. Sure. You would be horrified to see how much work Windows XP is doing <sighs> or was doing a few years ago. I feel their pain. I also love the amount of sass in this in this uh, post that I'm amazed they were allowed to write. What I don't love is they put in apostrophes in the URL, which make it basically impossible to copy correctly. Well, this is brutal. So it the issue starts happening on a Saturday during peak user time, and the problems continue on into Monday and Tuesday, like just issue after issue. Like you get one thing back up and working, then the players slam the service, and the next thing breaks. And unbelievably... By Wednesday, a week after constant login issues and crashes, the game had its highest ever concurrent players. Hundreds of thousands of players in one region alone, Blizzard said. Ready your ion cannons, kids. That is, I mean, and that was just like in the Australian region, I guess, too. But in the U.S., you had the highest concurrent users at the same time. It's, it's, what's going on? Why are these old games? Because they're good. Getting such, yeah. I know, but you know, like except for the Warcraft Three remake, that it's was just when you and I were growing up. Like everything our parents liked was stuff from like their high school years, and when you know their glory days, and they just never really like my folks. Just like you know, sometimes that's where their tastes are rooted. But uh, it seems like the stuff that came out during our formative years remains very popular. Like you see them keep remaking the movies that were from the eighties and the nineties, and you see them keep these video games. I, I mean, Nintendo has built an entire empire on refreshing nostalgia, you know? And it's remarkable that these old games clearly were good games, and it wasn't just rose-tinted glasses, because this is an astounding stat to see this is their highest concurrent users ever for a 20-year-old piece of software. Yeah, but okay, but, I mean, 
a Pink Floyd album is like multi generationally popular. I have a there's a 14 year old who lives in my house that she loves the nostalgia trip, right? Stuff older than from when you and I were growing up. I think it's just the classics are the classics. Yeah, I suppose. And maybe it's a confluence of the arts refined to a certain point, the technology was a certain point, and the and you know the budget for the build and the storytelling it was all at the right spot. Or can I fry some bacon? Oh, you know what? I love bacon. As long as it's not that stuff with the nitrates. You know, you got to cut that out. This is from Tristan, which there's your reference. Uh, maybe it's because new games, Diablo 3, are incorporating microtransactions and like loot crates and stuff like that too much. And the old games were like, y- you buy the game, you have the game. I love the idea that consumers uh, on mass don't like that stuff. That seems, I like that. Let's go with that. That's a good theory. I can tell you, my my son is an avid Nintendo fan. Yeah. A little too much. We got to limit that. <laughs> but he now prefers the regular Mario games. Like iPad games, he won't touch them. He's like, this is crap. Straight up Mario, you've got the game, you've got the game. If there's a secret, you find the secret, you've got the secret. It's 60 bucks, but you're not getting nickel and dimed. Yeah, but you buy it once and, and unless unless you're Reese and you decide to spill your apple juice on the cartridge. Um, but generally, you've got it once. Yeah, I mean, sure. I actually would be willing to bet you Nintendo will find clever ways to resell that game to your son over and over again his entire uh, life. <laughs> I just I'm signing up for the fifty dollar upgrade to the Nintendo online service because That's right because I, I need those sweet sweet Genesis games. And you know what? Their soup their their Nintendo game. Their guess what? Surprise surprise! Their emulation is spot on. <laughs> they do a great job. It's so good. It is. It is a lot of fun. And those old games, like like we were just saying, the Super Super Mario. That came out with the SNES. Oh, yeah. I'll sit down and I'll play that and I'll enjoy the hell out of it. I play it to go to bed. Yeah, really? Super Mario World. the one with, Yeah, the SNES one. Yeah. The first one, yeah. The first one on the SNES. Yeah. That's, I like to sit down and see how fast I can bust through the first world. Oh, yeah. And then I got it. Then you always, you get you got to get the secret above the first uh, ghost house. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you got to get the thing where you can jump ahead. Yeah. That's that's so nice, and then get Star Road going. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm a yeah. I'm a big fan of that stuff, and it just really does hold up. And you're right; it's so nice to have the whole game. Just one more nostalgia trip: Sonic Two or Sonic Three. You drink a bunch of Red Bull, and you see how fast you can go through it. <laughs> Linode.com/slash/coder. That's where Blizzard should be hosting their Diablo 2 servers. That's where we host everything because the performance is incredible and the stability is top-notch. They're our hosting provider now for over two years. I started there because I was I was honestly just a little curious to see how Linode does things because they've been around since 2003. Way before all of the big, uh, like, crazy VC-funded fly-by-night VPSs came in and before the big hyperscalers. So... How does somebody who's been doing this, how does a company that's been doing this for 18 years, how do they evolve and how do they keep competitive? And I was curious because I'd seen them at the events. I'd seen them supporting the community and I tried it out. Well, when it was time to go independent, I was so happy. And I was, by this point, I was, I was well into using Linode. I contacted them and said, I'd love to have you on the network as a sponsor. We're going independent again. Let's, let's work together. And man, has that been awesome because now all of you are seeing what's so great about Linode. And it's so refreshing in this age to have something just as straightforward as Linode. You go there, the pricing's very clear, it's very simple. Every system you get is going to outperform, it's going gonna, it's gonna to exceed your expectations. They have fantastic customer support, clear, clean documentation. It's all there. And it's just a breath of fresh air. It's so nice. Plus, They've been around forever and they're independently owned, independently financed. They, you know, they have paid their way. They're not, they're not taking like VC funding where they have to have total world domination or bust, right? And you can do things like a $5 a month server and just load it up with like, for me personally, I would recommend sync thing and a photo gallery that sits on top of that and just start there or go deploy your own GitLab server. They have one click deployments for developer environments. So that's another thing to consider is if you'd like to get started with a development environment in the cloud. They make that really, really straightforward. And you can support the show while checking it out. So you go to linode.com slash coder, get $100 in 60 day credit on your new account and you support the show. Linode.com slash coder. Go there, sign up, see what I've been saying, experience it for yourself. That $100 is going to actually let you test it and push it. That is a statement of confidence on Linode's part. 
and I think you're going to love it. Linode.com slash coder. Moving right along in the hoopla, let's talk a little Django. Might be time for a few hard things for Django lovers to hear, but I think we have to face it. Not a lot of excitement around Django these days. Well, so this is a complicated story, though, right? Because this piece of hoopla, I think, is correct, as is the next piece of hoopla. Uh Uh-oh. Great article, The Decline of Django, or Django, or Django, I don't know, who cares? Zamorin, Zamarin, right? (laughs) I think it's a good post. I think you should read it, especially if you're getting into Python and wondering what framework you should pick. The answer is Fast API. Yep. Or Flask, but... I could still see Django being appealing, though, just because it has such a body of work. It is so extensively documented, and there are so many success stories out there. Yes. I mean, if you're a Python developer and you're going to inherit a legacy app, it's probably going to be Django or Fast API. I'm sorry, or Flask. Um, The thing is, Django, as this article puts very well, has (laughs) it hasn't exactly, you know, a lot of work is being put into the async stuff for Python, and Django just isn't there. It's, it's been worked on for six years, hasn't happened. But I'm going to just like make this argument. What's wrong with Django just kind of being done? Right? Like it's, it's a web f- site framework, right? It's like Rails. It, in fact, it was like the, the Rails for Python. And it's kind of fine. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. You can totally ship like decent applications. Or hell, if you're just doing a site for some small business or even medium business, Django is a, a great choice, much like Rails is, right? Maybe it's not the newest, sexiest thing. It is slowly losing market share. I personally don't use it for reasons that make a lot of sense for my use case analysis. And you know, clients are a mix between fast API and and uh, and uh, Flask leaning more in the future towards fast API, just fat, you know, fast API was newer. It's matured now, but there's like, there's nothing wrong with Django. I, I like this article, but I, so I don't think technologies ever die. Right. I, I live in Florida and when I'm riding on my gator going for happy hour, do you have a saddle? No, no, you got to ride the gator bear. Ah. Governor DeSantis actually stops you. If he sees you riding on a gator, I've heard that, yeah, yeah. He says, I heard you're a software developer. Um, our unemployment system went down again. Do you happen to know COBOL? <laughs> hey, you there on the gator. <laughs> Which, the gator part aside, is a thing that really happened. The state of Florida was sending out notices to every company registered as a software developer and like actually calling me like, yo, dogs, do you guys know COBOL? Hey, you know what? Not a bad approach. If you're if the unemployment system or whatever is down, get that back up as fast as possible. <laughs> That's what I say. <laughs> well, one, I love you, Florida. Do you think they got it back up fast? No, <laughs> of course not. No, they probably got scammed at least twice. <laughs> and so the next time somebody writes in asking, you know, they're like 19, 20, they want to know what language they should learn. I'm going to say COBOL because the amount of money the state paid to get that site back up. No kidding, right? Holy crap. So my point being, one, yay, Florida. Two, none of this stuff ever really dies, right? Objective C is still around. I still get the quarterly call that there's some legacy crazy Mac thing or iOS thing in Objective C that someone needs a hand on. And it's great because you get to charge them a lot. That's true. That can be a specialty and it it can be a a good source of income. This is exactly the point I was going to make uh, right down to the COBOL. It is so true. And Django may, while it's definitely out of the hype cycle, a lot of times in technology, right as they're about to be replaced by the next thing, they get pretty good. Like that iteration, it, it, Generally, the iteration that comes out just after the hype cycle has passed, after people are using it, people have moved on, they're adopting something else. I swear in technology, a lot of times, that's when the original thing gets really good, well-refined, and also a lot of the money interest kind of relax a little bit because there's a new thing they're focused on, and that's no longer their baby, which, which eventually fades and is bad, but initially, actually, I think is a good thing for technology. And so... I would not be surprised if that applied to Django completely. Um, that's that's totally how the cycle works. You know, I, I also think this is another old man theme, right? 
that once you're around long enough, you realize that the thing you started doing may not necessarily be the thing you end doing. It seems like most of the world has moved on to Python 3. It just took a few years. Only 3% of Python developers are still using Python 2 in a survey that was conducted by JetBrains. 49% are using it for web development. That doesn't surprise me. The next most common use case, surprise, surprise, data analysis and then machine learning. Shocker. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not surprised at all. Mobile development, 3% of use cases. What are you people doing? <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's more common to use Python in games than it is mobile development. Embedded development at 6% which I guess is, is technically different than mobile. And then uh, networking programming, 16%. The bottom of the list is actually more interesting to me than the top of the list because the top of the list is everything. Can I just, can I just jump back real, real quick? So em- embedded is super different than mobile, right? Embedded is like your IoT devices. Yeah, that makes sense. I just didn't expect to see them broken out, but yeah, I, I, t- I get it, right? And uh, Oh no, because, well, because there's accelerated versions of Python that worked really, really well on like those uh, single board, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I guess it's sort of surprising it's so low with that in considered, you know? Well, C++ will never die. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I suppose that's true. Uh, okay. Science frameworks, NumPy, Pandas are the top two. Uh, and uh, web frameworks, you ready? Do, 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 do. Uh, number one is Flask. Number two is Django. Number three, Fast API with only 14%. But, you know, what do you expect? It's early days. So good. Uh, this all rings pretty true. Yeah. What, do you, what are your takeaways from this? The snake has a long tail and the future looks bright. Yeah. And I think the other takeaway is, is that 45% of respondents who are developing web frameworks are working in Django still. That's huge. Yeah. Uh, of those working in Python. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Well, my, my biggest was actually over half of the dev survey, granted this is a JetBrain survey, whatever that means, if that skews it, encountered Python in their educational experience first. Oh, yeah. Future site time, so someone can call me on this prediction next year. If that's true, then the cohorts that are like the junior, junior developers now, and like going to be coming out of school this year, or even like, you know, not really in the field yet. If all of these people have like good experiences of Python when they're young, I wouldn't be shocked if Python continues to be popular. Oh, absolutely. I mean, my, yeah, my point I being mean, as, as they go up the ladder and they get decision-making authority, right? Ah, ah, hmm. I think the only other thing that was notable from this JetBrain survey was that um, Visual Studio Code showed up as the number two editor. I don't know if that's um, with their extensions or not. Well, did you see the asterisk JetBrains put on that? Please note, we, we asked our own users. Thank you. That's why I find it so surprising is this is amongst their, it's probably, it's, it's, it's even larger in the general population, no doubt about it. I would argue that, that, that it's one and two the other way, where VS Code is probably bigger than, than uh, PyCharm Pro. Yeah. Even amongst JetBrains' own customers, Visual Studio Code has a very healthy second place, nipping at the heels of PyCharm Professional Edition. They got to be looking at that. Dude, you, I live in VS Code. If I were them, though, I'd be like, oh, okay, all right, well... We welcome our new VS Code overload, overlord, and all things are extensions in VS Code now. <laughs> no, I kid, I kid. Actually, you're joking, but they have a very healthy business uh, called ReSharper, where they sell a Visual Studio proper extension. Why not sell a VS Code extension? Yeah. Sure, there's a way to do it. Could it happen? Why not? You just have to log into your JetBrains account to, uh, to get it to run. Mm, to activate it or whatever. I mean, I doubt Microsoft with all their you-can-do-whatever-you-want developers. I, I doubt they're going to block that. So No, I would think that they'd actually like the idea. They would love it if VS Code became a dev platform for like actually targeting, not for just working. They'd probably happily integrate an app store. Hell, I would probably buy that ex- extension. Yeah, sure. Oh, uh, well, let's not. Let's, let's, not, <laughs> the let's not give them any Microsoft ideas. Microsoft Visual Studio Code app store with its own currency. <laughs> and I'm over here back in Vim. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. Oh, God. Datadog.com slash Coder Radio. You know, this here episode, yeah, it's sponsored by Datadog. Lots and lots of Coder Radio listeners have been checking out Datadog, the monitoring and security platform for developers, security professionals, operation teams, and anybody working in the cloud age. With Datadog, you can unify your metrics, your traces, and your logs all in one place, and you can troubleshoot your issues faster. That's going to save you time. That's going to save you money. And you can break down silos between teams and more easily communicate with visuals. That's 
nearly invaluable. And you can create real-time dashboards with Datadogs, and they have over 450 different technology integrations for your business. You can get started in minutes. The nice thing is you can easily pivot from a high-level overview of your entire environment right down to a granular visualization of your metrics and your events. Datadog gives you infrastructure monitoring, application performance monitoring, security monitoring, even user monitoring all in one place with just these beautiful dashboards that allow you to get at different levels and make it easier for other people to follow visuals like performance information, metrics, any kind of stuff, any kind of output. It's extremely useful and you can try it for free with a trial by going to datadog.com slash Coda Radio. See why thousands of companies are using Datadog and hundreds of Coda Radio listeners. They've chosen it as their monitoring solution. And when you start a free trial and you create one dashboard, Datadog will send you a free t-shirt. Yep, free t-shirt time. So get started by going to datadog.com slash Coda Radio. Go find out why everybody's trying it and how it can make a difference for you. Datadog.com slash Coda Radio. All right, I don't know why I want to do this. I guess I'm a glutton for punishment. But I want to talk a little Facebook. Ugh, why? I know, I know, I know. The internet brought the capability for people like yourself and people like me, even though we don't often choose to do it, to have the tools and marketing power that traditionally only the mainstream media outlets gave you access to. They were the gatekeepers to the public. Magazines, papers, television, radio. There was no internet ad. Then the internet came along, and companies like Facebook and Google came up with very clever ways to build ad platforms, and then they made it accessible to small developers, to small business developers and other small businesses around the world, mom and pop shops, et cetera, et cetera. Are they perfect? Are they a good company? Do I use Facebook? No. But they provide a critical role for medium to small businesses to get access to consumers who might want to buy their goods via advertising. It's a good old clean system in that regard. How they get that data, I don't, I don't necessarily agree with. But what I feel like is happening right now, for better or for worse, is Facebook is getting attacked. And they're getting attacked by media companies that have a massive, multiple conflicts of interest. Number one, media companies, what they really are, are platforms for advertising. They get eyeballs. They sell ads to advertisers. The advertisers then get their product in front of those eyeballs. Facebook is also that exact system. They are competing for the same eyeballs and the same exact advertisers. You got to appreciate that the media companies that are going after Facebook, they're competing with Facebook for the same paycheck. It is life and death for these companies. On top of that, social media is a time sink that takes people away from their platform. So not only is Facebook sucking up advertisers, but they're sucking up eyeballs and people's time. That's also an existential threat to everything from the Wall Street Journal to CNN and some dude's blog. And while I'm not here to defend Facebook, as you and I are recording on a Monday at noon Pacific time, there are 30 plus journalists finishing up a coordinated series of articles based on new leaked documents out of Facebook. And it just keeps coming over the last six weeks. There has been round and rounds of whistleblowers and leaks, and a lot of it has been mischaracterized as boogeyman technology. And I don't like the tracking, but it's been hyperbolic coverage that is a coordinated attempt to shut Facebook down, to knock it down, to get it regulated, to reduce its reach, to do whatever they can to just take a chunk out of Facebook. And it's everything from whistleblowing about uh, how Facebook affected the elections to how their AI platforms are inadequate at moderate, moderating and that, and that they, you know, they need to have more moderators and more fact-checking. And it's all, it's like this omnidirectional attack on Facebook from all sides. And I think no one, no one wants to see Facebook succeed. No one loves Facebook. So we're all just sitting back and watching the show, eating our popcorn. But really what you have is a giant traditional media organizations just a traditional legacy media attacking new media and the new media, like say Facebook goes away, right? They're gone. The world may be better overall, but small businesses and medium businesses will lose 
access to customers. And I, I know this is essentially Facebook's argument, but it is real. If Facebook went away and Twitter's censoring you, you can't, you can't go to NBC and run an ad about Alice in the nightly news. You can't go to the New York Times and advertise Alice because they'd want $300,000 from you. Where Facebook and Google, and you notice how Google manages to avoid all the scrutiny, that's another thing. A lot of these issues they bring up, Google is also just as guilty of, if not more guilty, especially with YouTube. But that's, that's not their target right now. Right now, their target is Facebook because they have billions of active users. But they will pivot. Mark my words, they will pivot to Google eventually after they take care of Facebook. I know I'm defending advertising and all of that, but I just, I just wish people would see what's happening. Like, maybe we're all okay with it. Maybe we're fine with this happening. But at least I just wish we'd all acknowledge that we're watching one group of competitors all gang up and murder another competitor. Yeah, I mean, everybody's got their own incentives, right? I, I don't know. To me, it's possible that everybody's kind of evil. True. I, you know, I, I just tried some Facebook ads for Alice, and that was a uh, rough experience. Yeah, that's why I wanted to bring this up, actually, because I know you know how invasive the ad tech is. Yeah, and it, it, really what I got was a bunch of people posting images saying, like, F Facebook, you know, whatever, like, anti-advertising stuff. It was, which I then had to pay for. So I, I killed that. So it was basically fake views. Is You were getting people who saw your ad, but they would respond pissy. They would respond pissy at Facebook, but then, like, that's posted on the Madbotter page for Facebook like obscenities and stuff like that. And that's, that sucks. That sucks. I don't know. Right. I don't feel that they do a great job of serving anybody really. Except for themselves. I mean, the, it's, it's, it's such a tough problem. I do think they're making tons of money. I do think they're like a very practical advertising platform for small businesses, but right now there's so much vitriol aimed at them. And also, they've lost a lot of their targeting ability, thanks to Apple. I just think about your situation where you're not going to events. You're literally, you had a problem where Twitter was blocking you. And so you couldn't really promote on Twitter. It, like, your your avenues for promoting the launch of Alice are, are narrowed by this stuff. And how are you ever going to get eyeballs if things keep trending this way? Because between just moderation issues and then um, media companies ganging up to murder Facebook... Like it's, it's taking away your options and I hate to defend Facebook. Like I said, I'm a glutton for punishment apparently, but it does seem ultimately like a loss for people like yourself. Well, and I'll be honest, like the mad uh, com is still blocked by Twitter. Wow. Really? And I can't get anyone from Twitter to respond, man. I mean, it just hurts more than ever during the pandemic with nothing going on like it's right and with with no explanation i mean there was a false positive for malware but that was resolved weeks ago and you fill out their form and there's no one to respond to ironically they emailed me asking if i want to buy ads so <laughs> i respond with my complaint to the email and they don't respond right when you were uh, facebook advertising do you think you kind of targeted geeks and that's why they reacted badly to the advertising because they didn't want to see ads because they're you know tech geeks yeah, I guess I did target kind of like geeks and engineering. Yeah. Because it seems like something that our our kind care about, but I don't think, you know, my family who uses Facebook just as a way to like keep tabs on people, I don't think they care. I think they like sometimes the advertising, they buy crap off of it. You know, I just feel like there's so much bad blood right right now that unless I want to take on another job of moderating the comments and stuff on the Facebook page, I'm not sure that I want to do it. Yeah, they're all, they all are dumpster fires, and part of me does like watching them get and take down a peg until this mob comes for your favorite tech company, and eventually will, because the reality is that anything, even, even to a degree JB, is a threat. Now, we're not a threat at the scale Facebook or Google is, so I don't think it'll ever be an issue for smaller content creators and platforms, but truly the problem here is that Facebook undermines their business model, and we are, we are witnessing we are witnessing quite the hit job, um, and it's a dirty one, too. You know, these insider leaks and stuff, it's dirty play. And um, I don't know if, I guess, too, if you're maybe not in the media business as much as I remotely am, uh, maybe you don't see it because you don't quite understand the whole advertiser and eyeballs dynamic and how that's life and death, perhaps. But uh, they'd know what they're doing. 
And, uh, you know, they, they uh, slam Facebook for causing political division and spreading misinformation when <laughs> they're the kings of it. <laughs> you know, that's the ironic part. Yeah, and, you know, just to undercut my own point, I'm complaining that Facebook is too permissive, but, like, Twitter, like, somehow we got flagged at one point, and they won't do anything, and there's no one to talk to, right? Because Twitter's thing is we'd rather ban than have, uh, have uh, you know, get negative blowback. And my thing is, if you're going to start playing editor and you're going to ban certain content, you got to have a system in place for when you get it wrong. Like, in the old days of the internet, what would happen is maybe your your domain would show up on an email blacklist and then, you know, a bunch of lazy email administrators who were one person managing a server of a thousand users. You're like, it was a, it was a, it was a long shot. You were ever going to get off their list, but this is 2021 and they built this thing in recent last year or two. They could have built this tooling such to solve this problem, but it wasn't a priority. It just didn't matter to them. And that to me is arrogance because you create this communications platform and then you begin to censor the communications platform. Sometimes it's justified. Sometimes it's not. And you don't create any mechanism to solve for when it's not, even though it's the nature of these kinds of tools. That's arrogance. And, you know, it shows you where their priorities are. So whatever. I just, I just, I guess I wanted to bring it up because of our recent conversation about kind of limited avenues for you to get the word out about a product launch. And clear and obvious public murdering we are watching happen right now. You've kind of turned me around a little bit because for the little guy, like, you know, when Facebook says hurting us is hurting small business, they're obviously being disingenuous. Yeah. But it is kind of like, I got to tell you, I'm super unhappy that I had to split off the Alice stuff into a different domain so I could post it on Twitter. Right. That's crazy. That was like that was like a weekend of hell that I didn't need. And I'm pretty sure that what happened with the Mad Botter site was two issues. I think they didn't like the Thaleo gives a, giveaways. Because if you go right now to the Mad Botter Twitter account and click on the URL in the Twitter account, you can go to it. You just can't post it. But they come up with a warning that it might be spammy. So I think because I don't use the corporate account very much, and I don't tend to promote things on the, that URL much, and when I do, it's usually the, you know, the, you know, whatever we were doing one for election day. I think that's actually what they did. Well, too bad. There's no way for them to simply expose what filter. Right. They could just say, we saw this post. It looks fake. Tell us it's not fake. Right. Do us some sort of human challenge or something. Make me fill out one of those stupid captures. Right. Like make me fill out the form or hell, make me email someone and have them like ask me. Right. And, and it, or could it be happening? millions of times a minute and so they just can't simply deal with the scale then that would suggest that the system isn't working properly so either they can't do it because of scale which means it's broken or they're arrogant pricks well the problem is if if the if the action they take is you simply can't post a small business's domain then the answer that well we can't handle the complaints telling us it's a false positive because it takes too long and we don't have the manpower that's that's not a good system right I mean, I had a thing I was talking on Twitter that this needs to be less like a private company, more like a utility where the punishment needs to be that you're you're not perma-blocked. You're, like, they are happy to solicit me for ad money. That's the funny part. Yeah, so it's, it's like they didn't even properly flag it in their system that, like, you know, th th like the irony or maybe that you're a bad user even like it's it's very it, it seems very specific to like that link. It's the domain. It's a it's there's a false positive on the URL, but there's no way to actually talk to a human. I mean, we used to joke years ago about the Google uh, support Python script, right? There's just no way to talk to someone to say this is just a mistake. Calm down. You know, let's let's work together on this. Even if there is something you don't like, fine, we can change it. But it's just like you can fill out this form and they explicitly tell you when you fill out the form that they're not going to reply. <laughs> it's like dealing with the IRS. It's like, how will you know? Hey, your next paycheck will be garnished. Right? Like You'll figure it out. Wow. I don't know. You know, what we clearly need is decentralized social media and a decentralized web ad system. I'm looking at Matrix. I'm not joking. I am. Well, that could. Yeah, that actually is true. That Matrix is pretty great. Uh, I do like it, but I don't think it's. Uh, I don't know. I don't think it's the full solution. I don't know. That's all. That's all my defense I have for Facebook. I just wanted to point it out 
that it's what's happening. And while it may be a net good for Facebook to go away, it will also have ramifications that are extremely beneficial to the very companies that are taking them out right now. And uh, that will be bad for small business. But it is what it is. Perhaps another solution will be born out of the ashes and be better than ever, like a phoenix rising. MySpace. <laughs> MySpace on the blockchain. By the time you're hearing this episode, the new quarterly report for our members should be out with lots of good stuff in there. If you're not a member yet and you want to support the show and get access to our quarterly report, go to coderqa.co. You support the show, you get a limited ad feed, and you get those quarterly reports that come out every quarter. And we appreciate that. Coderqa.co with a new quarterly coming out soon. Go find Mike while he still is on Twitter at Dumanuko <laughs> and his company's at the Mad Water Inc. For how much longer? Who knows? Get it while it's still there. Great. <laughs> I know, right? We should be careful because we used to joke about this kind of stuff with Apple and then they took it wasn't it wasn't that funny. <laughs> yeah. And so also go to Alice.dev while you still can. Yeah. yeah. Well, there you go. There you go. All right, I'm over on the Twitters at Chris LES. The network is at Jupiter Signal, and the show is at Coder Radio Show. Links to what we talked about today, yeah, that's there. Coder.show slash 436. That's where you find that. And of course, you can also find our contact page over there. We'd love to get your feedback. It's a big part of the show. Our RSS feed is linked there, too, if you want to get this show every single week in the podcast app of your choice. And we'd love to have you join us live on a Monday. We do it at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. Get that fresh Coder live. And then, of course, we always appreciate you downloading later on, leaving reviews, anything like that in your podcast directory of choice. Thanks so much for joining us on this week's episode of the Coda Radio Program. We'll see you right back here next week. <laughs>